Hello, and welcome to What is Innovation? The podcast that explores the reality of a word that is in danger of losing its meaning altogether. This podcast is produced by Outlast Consulting, LLC, a boutique consultancy that helps companies use innovation principles to solve their toughest business problems. I'm your host, Jared Simmons, and I'm so excited to have Tim Shum on the show. Tim Shum is the president uh, and founder of Lucas James Talent Partners. And uh, he and I had an opportunity to work together on uh, uh, with a client, and um, he's been kind enough to keep in touch and, and uh, develop a friendship. And I'm excited to have him on the show. He's a, a cool guy to talk to. Uh, Tim, thanks for joining us. Jared, thanks so much for having me. I'm looking forward to this. Much appreciated. Yeah, yeah. So uh, on the show, we talk to a number of different people in a lot of different fields. And so I'm really excited to, to, to talk to you, um, given the, the space that you operate in uh, and, and hear your unique take on innovation. Uh, why don't we start there? Um, what in your mind is innovation? My idea of innovation might be different than maybe some of the other guests that you have on or, or mm-hmm. someone like yourself with, with your background. But, but to me, innovation is a, is a mindset. You know, for, for me, I look at it and say, if, if we as a group are not innovating, we don't have continuous improvement, mm-hmm. we're not you know, striving towards a goal that when we reverse engineer that, that affects our day to day, our week to week, our month to month. Uh, so we're consistently getting better over time. Um, that, that to me is innovation mm-hmm. because that mindset over time, over the longer haul, will lead to outcomes that will benefit the greater good and will benefit us as an organization or myself as an individual within an organization. So, um, you know, to, to me, it's it's more of a framework and a mindset that if mm-hmm. you can get a culture around that, it's, it's very, very, very powerful. And I think, you know, in some ways it shows up in our industry and uh, in most ways not. There's a lot of group think that goes on. There's a lot of status quo. There's a lot of, hey, this is how things were done for years and years and years and years. And that's all I know. Mm, right, right. Tell me more about the industry. Yeah, sure. Uh, in t- <laughs> terms of how it works, just for our, for our audience. Totally, totally. Uh, I would imagine if you're listening, you are part of a business and you've either encountered a recruiter from the candidate side when you're a job seeker, even like a passive job seeker, someone reached out to you on LinkedIn. Or if you're a hiring manager, you've probably worked with a recruiting firm before. So mm-hmm. uh, there are 20,000 registered recruiting and staffing companies in wow. North America, it's very low barriers to, in, uh, to, to entry industry. Wow. You just need a phone and a laptop and a customer and go find candidates and you can you could potentially, you know, have your own business and, and plant your own flag there. Um, so that, that's the industry in a nutshell. We provide recruiting and sourcing services to find qualified candidates and talent for the companies that we serve. So out of the 20,000 firms, I would say about 95% of them operate in the exact same way, which is what's called on a contingent basis. Mm -hmm. So it's where the the customer, the company, whether it's Procter & Gamble or McDonald's or a large manufacturing company or a large services company, technology company, doesn't have to pay any money upfront as part of the engagement in the transactional model where the recruiting firm is on the hook to find and source qualified candidates. And only if that company accepts that candidate and then they have a start date and they get hired and they stay for 60 or 90 days, does that recruiting firm get to invoice the customer? Wow. So it's very, very, very unique. It's a, it's a brokerage business. It's very similar to residential real estate, right? You have a, a real estate broker that like does a bunch of showings and, you know, hoping for a big commission, that kind of deal. Very, very similar in our, in our industry. And it's and it operates the same. It has operated the same way for a very, very long time. The other side of the business you've probably heard of like temp services or, mm-hmm. or contractor services, uh, s- similar kind of mindset where there's no upfront fee, but they charge on an hourly basis for the individuals that are that are then placed. Okay. So okay. The staffing firm or the recruitment firm is the employer of record. They charge an hourly bill rate for the hours worked, mm-hmm. so on and so forth. And that, that's how the industry operates. You have your bigger players, um, call it Manpower or Ronstad, where I came from, Allegis Group, Aerotech, um, mm-hmm. that service a lot of different markets, service typically upper mid market and, and Fortune 1000 type organization. And then you have your smaller players that are one man or one woman shops in a basement, right. uh, servicing like a, a vertical. It's a, it's, a, it's a very, very, very large industry that's pretty old school in the way that it's operated for a long time. Interesting, interesting. And tell me more about 
So we talked about innovation being uh, your, your definition. I love it. Of innovation is a mindset uh, and, and the ability to put a framework around that mindset is what kind of really un unlocks that potential. If I can kind of paraphrase what, what you were saying. Uh, tell me about how that mindset led you to found um, Lucas James. Yeah, I, th I think of, you know, I've, I've had some great mentors along the way. They've instilled that that culture in me personally, and then those around me. So I, I, I don't take a ton of credit for that. Um, but you know, that that framework is, you know, not necessarily in stone, but the way that I look at it is like, okay, what what's the baseline? What's the status quo today? Who are we looking to serve, i.e. the customer mm -hmm. externally or internally, right? When we put ourselves in that person's shoes, what's my day to day look like? What are my pain points? What would uh, make me, you know, get a promotion, get a raise, uh, sleep better at night, whatever the, the case is. And then how do we reverse engineer that backwards and then change what we're doing today in a continuous improvement mindset to mm. get where we're looking to go. Wow. So, um, you know, whether, whether that's, you know, I, I spent 10 years at one of these big staffing firms that operated like everybody else. Right. So I think, you know, we've been able to differentiate ourselves with, with minor tweaks and processes or hiring or okay. whatever to create a secret sauce that would replicate success and continuous improvement over the long haul. Um, that showed up personally in my, my professional career as a salesperson there. Mm -hmm. um, I remember back in 08, 09, <clears throat> we just had our last, you know, last big recession. Right. Yeah. My industry got smoked <sighs> back then. You think about some of the industries that, that got hit really hard. It was mortgage, banks, and staffing firms. No one was hiring. Uh, right, back then. right. Didn't think about so that. So I, I uh, you know, stumbled across uh, a relationship and an opportunity for uh, government services contractors that were basically doing business in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Kuwait. And they said, hey, we don't have any openings right now in Chicago, but we have 20 openings in, in Afghanistan. Can you support us there? <laughs> Staffing people to work in Afghanistan. In Iraq and Kuwait. And I'm like, <laughs> what? Uh, I'm like, I don't know, 25 at the time. Like, sure. Like, I don't want to overpromise and under deliver, <laughs> sir. You know, <laughs> right. putting my hair away. So, you know, what we did, it was essentially we went back to corporate that this multi-billion dollar company presented a business case. Like, hey, listen, there's an opportunity here when there's not opportunities elsewhere, but we have to like look outside of what we're currently doing right. in order to make it work. Right. right? We got to make sure employees get there safe. We got to make sure we have the right insurance requirements. We have to like change our process and we need to look like outside of that. So if you're okay with me going after this, we'll make sure that we're good from a risk, risk standpoint for everybody that's involved. But I need a little bit of autonomy to like make this thing work. So we're serving the customer uh, in this case, which was a much different customer supporting a hiring manager and Kuwait or Af Afghanistan than, you know, the, the manufacturing plant down the street in Chicagoland area. Right. Right. So right. that, that was just a really fun experience over, let's call it a, a three, four year period where we were able to build a business within a business with complete autonomy to set up the team, how we wanted to, to take the customer and say, what's the goal here and reverse engineer that backwards and say, what resources do we have today? Because we are part of an organization that's mm -hmm. done well with the standard staffing model. And then how do we apply what the customer needs um, and what we can do to that? And it, it, it was entrepreneurship. It built a business that was very, very large uh, with a lot of people involved. I don't take all, all the credit for this, but it built up a really, really large business within an already large business right. and became a significant percentage of revenue at a time where there wasn't a lot of people hiring. So that was, that was a very like, when you talk about innovation, that stuck with me. Cause mm -hmm. like, I, I think as a, as an innovator, as an entrepreneur, as you know, if you're looking to really make your name for yourself up the corporate ladder, well, regardless of the industry, you know, you need some experiences in your life that give you the confidence that when you step outside the box and you take a chance on something researched, of course, right. that it pans out well. And sometimes you're going to make mistakes along the way. But if you have that autonomy, you have confidence and you have the support, ultimately getting some success there, you know, to me, it's like you can kind of innovate anything. Right. Yeah. yeah. Anything can be optimized. That's right. As a result of that experience. So um, you, you it started the question, what are you doing today to kind of disrupt this industry? Yeah. So at Lucas James Talent Partners, I started the business two and a half years ago. 
uh, we're, we're basically an alternative to the 95% of the staffing companies and recruiting firms that are out there. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have a team of uh, senior, mid-level, and junior recruiters and what we call candidate sourcing specialists. Mm -hmm. um, we, we are tech-enabled, so we have world-class technology in our technology stack. And then we allow our customers to tap into re our resources, not on a, not on a fee basis, 20, 25% really, really large, high expensive fees, right. but on, a, on an hourly basis to uh, give bandwidth okay. to an internal talent acquisition department. Got it. So the problem is the, the reason there's an industry in the first place is these companies cannot perform the recruiting depart, uh, function themselves all the time. Right. So right. when they have you know busy periods or cyclicality or seasonality or attrition happens or there's a new project and they have staffing needs that outweigh their internal ability and bandwidth to you know fill those needs with, mm -hmm. with great people, they have to go outside of the industry. So the, the the best way to do it is internally, and we give these organizations a very on demand flexible option to get dedicated senior seasoned resources with technology behind them. Uh, to add to their internal teams. So uh, this this route is much more cost effective. We end up being 40 to 60% more cost effective on a cost per hire basis. And I can get into that. Mm -hmm. um, it's flexible. So, you know, we are a partner where we can flex up and down based on hiring demand throughout the year. Because often right. companies, regardless of size, are busy in Q1 because budgets just hit. Right. Maybe slower in Q2, Q3 with a, a project and. We, we allow the flexibility to scale us up and scale us down as your hiring demand in, increases. So that's, that's great for the CFO right. to hear, yeah. especially during a pandemic environment. So tough to execute. I think like we have a road ahead of us to innovate and really dial in this model. Mm -hmm. um, but we also have a blank slate and there's not a, a, an organization like us that's large and well-known within our industry. And it's, it's our goal to become that, but we have a long road ahead of us in order to do that. Yeah, no, I mean, I can imagine it's going to be, uh, well, I know the model and I've had an opportunity to, to, to work with you and your team and, and I, I see and understand the benefits firsthand of kind of this innovative uh, approach and the fact that uh, it, it's not, it feels more like um, calling someone up and this is not an, an analog from uh, for my uh, talent standpoint, but it's almost like calling someone up from AAA to play with the big ball club for a couple of weeks while somebody's injured. Sure. You know? Absolutely. Um, and I, I, that's the way I look at it is, okay, we've got this mountain of work and we don't have enough people to do it. Let's bring these experts in who already know our, who we've worked with before, who already know our systems, and they are deep, deep subject matter experts in the area that we need help. And that allows you to free up your utility players to continue with the this baseball analogy, but to free up your utility players to do other things within the company, knowing that you've got deep subject matter experts ready to go at a moment's notice. And that's what it did for, for, uh, for my clients, uh, is it allowed them to take those scarce internal resources and redirect them somewhere else, knowing that experts uh, we're, we're kind of on the case um, to, to take care of that. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. And I think, you know, when we, when we jam, when we chat, we geek out on, on business stuff, right? Yeah. Any brokerage business is an inefficient business model. Mm. It just is. We're yeah. like, you know, you have to basically like pay the middleman on an outcome. Right. Meaning like the, the, the middleman is not getting any services up front. They're not getting any invoices. They're not getting any money or monetization up front. Right. Only when they execute a services. So when you look at, I mentioned a few staffing and recruiting is one residential real estate, commercial real estates, and other insurance mm -hmm. operates the same way where you have these agents that are basically operating in a model that just like is what it is. It's been like this for decades right? where, you know, I have to go find customers and then I, I have to tell my customer, Hey, um, I'm going to go do like six weeks of work for you for free. And I'm going to try to do my best. And I'm going to cross my fingers that I can monetize this <laughs> um, or find the house that you're looking for or I'm up against four other insurance brokerages yeah. bidding on this business and like yeah. six, eight, 10, 12 weeks worth of work that I 
that I win it at the end of the day. And what happens is if you're on the vendor side, which I was, there's a lot of inefficiencies there. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, my, my last role at this large recruiting company, I was managing, I don't know, 60, 70 recruiters. And if I was being really, really honest with myself, I would say 60, 70% of mm. my recruiters time went unmonetized. Wow. And the firm I was part of did a damn good job too. Like we were one of the best. Yeah. 60 to 70% is, is best in, is probably best in class is what you're saying. Here's what happens in our industry. Wow. It's like Jared needs a, a salesperson for outlast consulting. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to go work on that for six weeks. And then six weeks come by, I, I present you four great, great candidates. Oh, Tim, I'm sorry. I got a referral from, I'm just going to hire my cousin, you know, sorry, man. <laughs> and I'm like, ugh, yeah. there's a big fee there. Right. Right. So a lot of other things happen. You're, wow. the, the customer's incentivized to call like four recruiting companies at the same time, mm -hmm. have them duke it mm -hmm. out, all this kind of stuff. Or like, Hey, it's, there's no skin in the game. So let's see what they come up with. All this kind of stuff happens. Yeah. It's really, really frustrating. It's really frustrating to manage recruiters that are going through this because they get unmotivated and there's right. high turnover in the industry as a result of this. The key point is the industry has to charge a lot of money mm. to offset this inefficiency. 25% of a $80,000 <laughs> salary person is 20 grand. Wow. It could just be two phone calls. Right. Right. It's right. a lot of money. It's like, it's the standard in the industry. It's crazy. Wow. No one, no one's saying, Hey, why is this? That's crazy. And it's because the model's messed up, man. Like mm. it's people are getting burnt out and every brokerage model or marketplace model has been disrupted either by the change in the business model or technology over time. Wow. Hey, I wish I had a bigger technical bone in my body to create <laughs> like an AI, you know, marketplace for right. connecting businesses and candidates. I think people <laughs> are on it and I think it's going to be a while before that happens, but yeah. you know, we're, we're out to change the, the model over on its head. We have a, kind of a messaging opportunity, but also a challenge ahead of us because mm -hmm. we're going up against, a, you know, decades and decades of a model that's just been implanted in the buyer's head. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, what I, what strikes me about this and the way you talk about it and the way you frame it uh, is, is the role of empathy. Uh, I can hear it in your voice The you know, kind of, and the way you described it, kind of starting at the, you know, in that internal resources life, what they think, how they're rewarded, what they're trying to, what problem they're trying to solve and kind of working back. It also sounds like there's a bit of empathy for other people in your industry. And maybe uh, I could imagine you might have a different culture internally um, as a result of that. I, mean, I can imagine you'd be a great, this would be a great model to work in if I were a recruiter versus, you know, the traditional model. From from a our, our team standpoint, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. They're they're yeah. working on stuff where so because the client's paying hourly, and it's trust me, it's tougher on the sales end mm -hmm. to 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 engage. Right, there's got to be a right. lot of trust there, case studies, yep. all that kind of stuff. They got to trust that it works. Um, but when when we get in there, we do a great job. You know, they're incentivized to only give us positions that they want us working on. Right. And like, you know, that our time is optimized. So the recruiter is only working on stuff that moves. They're making an impact. Mm -hmm. People are getting hired. They're high-fiving their candidates. They're high-fiving each other. And I think that's, you know, tur just turning the model up on its head yeah. made a world of difference. And for me, frankly, you know, managing the old model, you had to hire them cheap and out of college. You know, you had to teach them professionalism in the industry. Right. And... You had to like keep them motivated in, in other ways because there was a lot of stuff that, that was outside of their control. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so like it was tiring. You had to work 60, 70, 80 hours a week just to, you know, d differentiate yourself in that industry. That, that was our thing. Outwork the competition. Right. Right. Because it's about at bets. That's because right. Because you can't really necessarily control the outcomes in the same way. That's right. Mm. You're absolutely right. Mm. So yeah, I'd like to think that, but like, listen, like we we talk about like innovation for real mm -hmm. in this industry. Um, in my lifetime, um, there, there's going to be technology that does all this stuff, or at least most of it. Right. Okay. Like there's yeah. still a human element, you know, of if I'm going to start working at a company, I want to make sure I feel comfortable from like a trust standpoint. You can't right. do that with a computer. That's right. But like the sourcing, the, some of the screening, 
stuff, mm-hmm. the scheduling, the, you know, automation of like reference checks. Right. And like, think of all these, these things like yeah. that, that's the people that are really tackling that problem. I think they're going to be dealing with like a, maybe a timing issue, mm-hmm. but it's, it's bound to come in this industry. And I'm not naive to think that it's not. And how does that, how does that inform the way you view the industry and your, and your, your, or your company's place in it? So here, here's what's going to happen in my opinion mm-hmm. is that uh, once this type of technology starts to get adopted, it could be five years, probably at the soonest, 10 years, 15, whatever it is, mm-hmm. the, the internal, it's going to give more power and internal leverage for the, the corporate recruiting function at these companies. Mm. Right? So they're going to be able to do more with less and have to rely less on outside vendors. Right. The first one to have pain is the contingent recruiting firm that's transactional and charges 20, 25, 30%. It's right. first going to start off with pricing pressure because yep. you're going to have to compete in one way or another to like get those opportunities that you get used to get before. There's going to be some consolidation there. And then um, hmm. for, for us, we provide bandwidth to that internal team. Right. So as long as we're tech enabled and they still need like human bandwidth, right? we'll be okay. But like I said, I'm not naive to think that um, we can't be looking out for that in the future. We may need to pivot on a dime right. or frame ourselves up in a certain way or you know, make strategic decisions that, that go along with that. Right. I think you're in an enviable position of um, already being outside, the, outside of the mainstream, you know, outside of that 95%. So um, I think that when you're, when you're following the, the accepted playbook, the antibodies to anything new and different are real and they're immediate, you know, um, to protect, sort of double down and protect what you have. And that's, I think that's going to push most folks in a different direction from you guys who are already outside of that model where, you know, a, a new way of doing things, I think will be less threatening to quote unquote way of life. I think so. I think um, like, look, what I'm doing isn't like revolutionary. I'm not the, the, the pioneer of mm-hmm. like an hourly model. It just hasn't yeah. really taken effect. And there hasn't, there aren't major players out here that are doing it the way that we're doing it. But sure. recruiting process outsourcing as an umbrella idea mm-hmm. is gaining a lot of steam. So I see the industry kind of headed in that direction, but I, I love this stuff. Yeah. Uh, we work with a lot of technology companies. Um, so a lot of like early stage and growth phase technology company. So think like mm. when a series A, series B, series C happens, venture capital backed, they got they go 20 to $50 million and they got to go hire dozens and dozens and dozens of people. Right. This, this model makes sense there. Right. But the conversations that I enjoy the most are, how did you make it this far? What's the product roadmap yeah. in the future? And I'm picking the founder's brain. I'm picking the CPO, the chief product officer's brain, the CTO's brain. Mm-hmm. And it's amazing how certain people think about innovation, research and development, and coming up with solutions that are outside of the box. Right. And it's all about like what we're talking about, like user experience, um, testing, talk to a million people to figure out what they need, what they want and build a product around that that's providing value for people and then optimize it along the way. Right. And it's like, it's, it's kind of simple when you say it that way, probably hard to replicate, but mm-hmm. these is, this is why these companies are kicking butt is because they focus on the customer. They figure out a pain that there's not a solution out there for, there's some sort of, you know, status quo group think offerings and solutions that have been around for a long time. Right. And they optimize these things. And the ones that really focus on the customer and build like a, a culture around this internally. Right. They kick a lot of butt. And it's yeah. really cool to see. And I, I I always think about how do I apply that to my like old school services business that's very people driven. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, and it shows. It shows. I I think the view of innovation as a mindset uh, you know, the framework approach to, to scaling that within your company uh, and, and your ability to kind of see the innovation in the, in the evolution of your, of your industry. Uh, and, and the great example of, of uh, recruiting in, in Afghanistan, I, I just can't imagine. I think all of that kind of adds up to uh, a view of innovation that doesn't necessarily involve um, chemicals or widgets or, you know, uh, technical 
know-how with a keyboard or, or a computer um, uh, because we innovation has been happening you know since since the dawn of man I'm so I'm certain and uh, and just I, I love your examples because they help everyone in no matter what you do and where you are in in the corporate world you know trying to start your own thing in, in a different type of uh, job everyone can think about how they can be a bit more innovative in what they do to try to push to try to move things forward and solve problems for people and do it in a way that uh, is empathetic and uh, and takes the person that they're they're serving uh, into account up front. Look, I, I look at, you know, we've all heard of like lean or Six Sigma. The, the term I love that I, to use that I've pulled from there is continuous improvement, the continuous improvement mindset. Because mm-hmm. I don't think like, yeah, for, for everyone, not everyone's going to be an Elon Musk right. or you know, invent the next best thing that kind of changes the world. I think that's okay. To me, innovation is, you know, you don't need to be the inventor of something that's better than where you're at today. Mm -hmm. How do you create a culture where you're striving towards that? So I don't know, we're just over two and a half years in business. We are way better at a lot of things than we were this summer yeah, or at the beginning of the year. Right. Or definitely this time last year, definitely when I started the business. And I think it's, you know, how, how do you create a culture around, hey, uh, let's break down our initiatives over the course of a year. Let's bite off and chew maybe one or two of these things each. Mm-hmm. And then if we're moving the needle in sales and marketing and operations and recruitment technology and back office support, a little bit, little bit, little bit, you're going to pick your head up. And like, that's going to look like innovation to you. Yeah, like, That's going to be an outcome that you couldn't have dreamed that your collective group could be doing otherwise. Right. But it's, you know, it's a little bit of long-term thinking. It's a lot of like being, being good with trying things that are new, mm-hmm. that'll fail mm-hmm. and having people be cool with that. And you as a leader, not chewing their head off because they made a mistake or they went out, they thought outside the box and it didn't work out. Right. Because eventually they're going to think outside the box and something is going to work out. And you want to make sure that you're creating an environment where the, those ideas come to the forefront. And for us, it could be as simple as a new form. Right. Or, you know, a, yeah. a different template for yeah. candidate submittals to our clients. You know, right. it could be something as simple as that. But right. we just, you know, you got to, you have to have an environment that encourages that, I believe. Yeah. Well said. Well said. Any advice? for innovators out there? Good question. Um, d- don't be afraid to continually step outside of your comfort zone. Mm-hmm. That could be comfort zone in terms of how you communicate, your tasks, doing things differently, uh, challenging others' thought processes. Uh, don't be afraid to step outside of your comfort zone because we all, we all start at, at our, whatever our baseline is. Right. In terms of experiences or talents or, you know, f- you know, for me, like a lot of what I do today, it's like public speaking to the team, public speaking in forums like this, um, right. sales stuff, you know, talking to a f- CEO of a big company. I, I don't know, like tough conversations with team members that need to be had, but are done in a way where they get motivated at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Like when I started when I was 22 with business stuff, all that stuff was outside of my comfort zone. <laughs> right. Right? That would suck to do. Any, yeah. any of those things that I mentioned, you're yeah. like scared to hell. Now I can do yeah. it in my sleep because of experiences. But, you know, I, I, to always tell people like, just push yourself a mm-hmm. little bit, a little bit, a little bit. Take those chances. It's in your own head. You know, p- people don't care about Tim. <laughs> really, <laughs> honestly, people don't care if Tim didn't do well on Jared's podcast. You know, it's all in my head, right? right? Of, of how other people are going to think about Tim. Like, keep pushing yourself out. Keep pushing yourself out. So next mm. opportunity in your office, corporate setting at home, you know, take that chance. Try it. And for for some people, that may be research the hell out of that before you put your foot forward. For some right. people, it's like, hey, jump in with two feet and, hey, whatever happens, but learn and learn and learn and learn. And then you're going to get good at something. And if you do that over the long haul with that mindset, you know, sky's the limit, I think. Yeah. So um, I always try to tell that to, to people on my team. Uh, that's great. That's great advice for all of us. Uh, and uh, yeah, this uh, I can look back and see a similar kind of, if you had told me 15, 20 years ago, what I was going to be doing all day, um, I would say, no, thank you. Comfort zone is, is critical, knowing it and then pushing it. You know, so thanks for sharing that. And uh, 
Thanks for your insights and uh, appreciate your willingness to join us. It's a it's a fascinating business model and uh, in an industry that 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 you know d- that needs new and fresh thinking. And so I I really admire what you do and and why you do it. Um, so thanks again for your time, Tim. And uh, looking forward to the next one. I admire you too, Jared. Thanks so much for having me. Take care. Take care. We'd love to hear your thoughts about this week's show. You can drop us a line on Twitter at Outlast LLC. That's O-U-T-L-A-S-T-L-L-C. Or follow us on LinkedIn where we're Outlast Consulting. Until next time, keep innovating, whatever that means.